so I did serve in Afghanistan. Um, I was lucky enough to get civilians out of Libya when the regime collapsed. And then towards the end of my time, I, I sort of served off the coast of um, Somalia, uh, specializing in sort of counter piracy. What people don't often say, and certainly what I don't often share, is that I finished in the bottom quarter of my batch. Okay? Comfortably. That was under, I was under no illusion. I think that was probably the polite way of them saying, you finished bottom, but we'll put you in the bottom quarter so you think that you're probably not quite as low as you did. Um, so I was rubbish in training. Um, I really didn't sort of pick it up quickly. Um, I wasn't quick to pick up the tactics, the ability to live in the field, any of those kind of things. None of it came naturally to me. But I knew I could get better. Um, and I knew that I could improve. And I knew that that revolved around what I did with my time um, and how I chose to behave. And I guess this kind of sort of set me off on a path to try and understand high performance. Um, and really, I wanted to understand it uh, really because I felt there was a sort of ethical responsibility. Okay? So in the world in which we inhabit, in which I used to inhabit, um, high performance isn't, isn't a luxury. It's a necessity. And in my view, leaders in the military have an ethical responsibility to get better. And I know there's a few people here with a sort of footballing background in the audience. Um, and I know that you're, you, know, you spend a lot of time experiencing pressure, and that pressure is very, very real. But when someone misses a penalty, or when England get knocked out of the World Cup, people go home disappointed. When a serviceman loses, they go home in a box. So it's a very, very different game. So I, I come at this with a view that understanding high performance and looking at where organizations, individuals, people have been successful, I come at that from a lens of this is an ethical responsibility in order to help your people and in order to help make sure your plan survive. And that is really where my sort of curiosity comes from. Um, there is no definition for leadership. So I'm aware that I kind of have to relate this to leadership on some level. Um, and I sat there, you know, sort of racking my brains, thinking about, you know, what is, what is the definition for leadership that I can come up with? And my view on this is that there isn't one. You should be very wary of someone that goes, this is how you lead. Because I can take my experience from Afghanistan and all these different places, put together a sort of simple model and say, this is how you do it. And if you're leading a team of accountants or footballers, it's not going to work because it's based on my experience. So there isn't a single definition and other people decide whether or not you're a good leader. It's not up to you. It's up to you, the team around you. It's up, to, uh, it's up to them and their perception on you. And they judge you based on your behavior, okay? But behavior is entirely context dependent. So a lot of organizations that I've worked with will, will have someone in who'll be sort of saying, what we need to do is we need to push decision making down into the organization and we need to empower people as much as possible. By and large, I think, yeah, that's sensible. That makes sense most of the time. However, if one of you was to walk across the road, the A30, just outside the gates here, and someone gets hit by a car, do you really want me to turn to you and go, how would you feel about calling an ambulance right now? Do you feel empowered to make that decision? No, because the context is wrong. And I think a key element of leadership is understanding the context quickly and shaping your behavior and how you act in accordance with that context. We talk a lot about leadership by example. Fundamentally, leadership by example is about choosing the right behavior. And you can see this everywhere. So I'm married. I've got a five-year-old daughter and a two-year-old son. And for, those of the, for, for those of you in the room that have children, this story may well resonate. About three months ago, my daughter woke up in the middle of the night and was, came into our room and couldn't sleep scared of the dark, something or other, I forget, I was sort of half asleep. My instinct was to go, just go back to your room, just go back to your room, go back to your room and go to sleep, okay? And so I got up and I took her back into her room, I'm trying to control this situation, and I'm trying to use what I'd done in the past, just go to bed, for God's sake, it's three o'clock in the morning. My daughter burst into tears, as only a five-year-old can do when they're yawning and they're absolutely melting and no amount of logic and persuasion is working. My wife comes in, very groggy. She sort of moves me out of the way, respectfully, moves me out of the way. She sits down with my daughter, she puts her on her lap and she just strokes her hair. Just strokes her over and over and over again. 
And that was one of the sharpest lessons in leadership that I've learned. And I learned that only six months ago. Because what she was able to do is see the context, see what needed to be done, realize that logic and persuasion weren't working and that I was being completely ineffective and change her behavior in order to match what was required okay, and get the outcome we're looking for. It's a lesson at home at 3 o'clock in the morning on a Tuesday night. It's one of the most powerful lessons I've learned about leadership. So leading by example is about choosing the right behavior. And if you believe in leadership by example, and I know this organization absolutely encourages you to think like that. You need to be good in the field. You need to be good at your job to inspire your men and women. I completely understand that. But if you believe in that, you start to ask the sort of follow-on questions, which is, would I want to be led by me? Because in lots of organizations I work with, one of the first things I'm faced with is a barrage of complaint about the leadership. It's like they're rubbish, they don't know what they're doing. It's like, okay, all right, so it's all about them, they're failing. Okay, so how have you thought about setting them up for success? How have you influenced them? Because it goes both ways, and often people are sort of a bit shaky on that answer. And I think this is an interesting question. Would I want to be led by me? You look yourself in the mirror, think about what you did in the last 24 hours and how you handle various situations. Do I want to, would I want to be led by me? That's a much harder question to ask because it requires some self-reflection. And it leads you on to think, does my behavior inspire other people to be better? And then you start thinking about yourself. You start thinking about being a better person, a better soldier, a better husband, father, and a friend. Because you're now looking into the mirror. And all of those things that you think people can't see, you see, you know, when you, when you don't tell the truth, and someone else finds out about it, or when you talk about someone behind their back, everyone knows, and at the back of their minds, what they really are thinking is, they're talking about someone else, but they probably do the same with me. So you start to think about being a better person. Your behavior, though, is shaped by the decisions that you take every single day. We make about 33,000 every day, some of them conscious, including what we put on in the morning, others completely unconscious. That's what we're going to explore today. Better decisions lead to better outcomes for you and the people that you hope to inspire. Now, the reason I've sort of shared that is that I just wanted to sort of shape the context and really explain what it is that I'm going to be talking about today, because ultimately this is what we're here for. We're all about making better decisions and ultimately winning or improving performance. So what I'm going to talk to you about is three quite distinct things. I'm going to talk to you about mental models. I have to get this across. If I dive straight into the OODA loop, I'll lose you very, very quickly. I have to help you to understand what a mental model is, and I want to make you aware that you all have them. We're then going to talk about the OODA loop, which stands for Observe, Orientate, Decide, and Act. Now, most of you sat here in, in green will, will have heard of that before. Some, some others maybe have sort of talked about it or, or have come across it um, in various areas. I think it's very poorly understood. Because if you can't understand what a mental model is, you can't understand the power of the OODA loop. Okay? And the last thing is, is I want to talk about, okay, so what? It's a great conversation, Rob. That's a brilliant talk, hopefully. Um, how do we use it? How do I take something from this and practically apply it? That's really, really important. The first point I have to make is that the world is too complex for us to understand. Okay? Stuff goes on that we have no understanding of, and we can never hope to understand it, all right? Because there is, it's just, there's just too much complexity, all right? The term VUCA has often been used, and we've heard about it over and over again. It's volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous, okay? This is a famous slide from Afghanistan, which basically explains, I guess, the problem. And I believe it was Stanley McChrystal who sort of sat back and said, by the time I understand that slide, we will have won here. But complexity, complexity is everywhere. If you go back in time to early 2008, and if I'd said to you, right, I'm going to place a bet with you, right? In 10 years' time, Donald Trump will be the president. Britain will be about to crash out of the European Union. An unloan... Uh, MP from Islington will be the leader of the Labour Party and have moved everything to the far left. And England will have just reached the semi-final of a World Cup. You'd have gone, yeah, I'll take some of your money off you. Happy with that. 
Okay, that's four examples of things that were not predicted to happen. Okay, and the experts have been shown to be completely wrong. And I think one of the reasons is is because the world is far too complex for us to understand, and we fool ourselves into thinking we know we have simple understanding of cause and effect, and that's not true. What we do in order to get past that complexity and overcome that is we come up with mental models. So all of you will understand how a bicycle works, all right? So you all have a mental model of a bicycle. So I flash that picture up and go, right, I've just designed this new bicycle. You'll look at me and go, it's not going to work. That's an example of how you understand a concept and you can immediately write that off as something that won't work. Now, sometimes these mental models work. And often they get reinforced by successes that we have. So a way of approaching something that brings you success. Okay, I'll do more of that. Makes sense, right? And sometimes they don't. Sometimes these models get disrupted. And sometimes that's pleasant. And sometimes it's really unpleasant. So when Susan Boyle walked out onto the stage at the X Factor, and I think it was 2012, you can see the audience looking at her going, oh, here we go. This is going to be one of those ones where she's going to be disastrous and Simon Cowell's going to go nuts and Piers Morgan's going to do his thing. So you start to play out a picture of what's going to happen in the future based on your expectations, based on your mental models of what someone like this looks like. And then she absolutely nails it. And there's this moment where, so I think it's Ant or Deck, I don't know which one's which, turns to the camera and says, see, you weren't expecting that, were you? And it's absolutely true. And this is the thing about surprise. Whenever you are surprised by something, it's a little bell ringing that tells you that your mental models were not appropriate or they haven't worked. Because everyone plays out the future in their mind. Humans have an incredible ability to do that. And surprise means that that, that playing out of the future in our mind has been disrupted on some level. This is a perfect example of it. Okay? Those are examples of a couple of mental models. We're going to keep coming back to this stuff because I really want to make sure that I land this point. The first thing I want to do is demonstrate to all of you that you have mental models. And we're going to do that, do that using a really, really simple test. Okay? So um, what I want you to do is uh, look at this scale. Okay? Let's take the top one there. So if you're casual about appointments, you're a sort of naught to one. All right? If you're never late, if being late is an unforgivable crime for you, you're a four, okay? And what I want you to do is basically score yourself against each of those, I think it's 13 questions, all right? Just go down and, and calculate your cumulative score. Top score is 52, so if you've got 56, you've done something wrong. Top score is 52, okay? Just calculate your cumulative score. I'm going to give you a minute to do that now. And then once you've finished calculating your score, I just want you to stand up then I know that everyone's done. And then we're going to play a little game. At some point, that social pressure of all of those around you stood up is going to become unbearable for some of you. Okay, we're pretty much there. Just wait for the rest of the paras to stand up. <laughs> so, I had to get one joke in there. Um, so, what I'm going to do, so top score is 52. If you are a 52, you're pretty far on the end of the type A personality spectrum. What I'm going to do is I'm going to have a bit of a bet with you. So, 
Top score is 52, and I'm going to count down from 52 all the way down to wherever we get to. Um, and I believe that nearly all of you will be sat down by the time I hit the number 30. I'm pretty confident of that. Certainly three quarters. So let's give it a go. So as I read out your number, sit down. So 52, 51, 50, 49, 48, 47, 46, 45, 44, 43, 42, 41, 40, 39, 38, 37, 36, 35, 34, 33, 32, 31, 30, 29, 28, 27, 26, 25. Okay, so everyone who's still standing is on the type B spectrum. Everyone who's sitting down is on the type A. Now, everyone sit down, okay, because I don't want to make you feel uncomfortable. So, this is a really, really blunt tool that talks about personality, okay? Now, I don't want anyone to think, oh, type A is good, I should have been sat down with all the other people, type A is bad. That's not how it works, okay? This is just about where you naturally sit, or certainly where you've been uh, developed to sit on that spectrum. So, typically speaking, in most of the organizations I work with, people are like, well, you want to be a type A, right? They're the leaders. They're the ones who are successful. They're the people that get stuff done. They're like me. I'm a type A. That's what you want to be. Okay? It's just an example. It's like a collection of mental models, a way of behaving. All right? Not always true. They're not always successful. So how do type A personalities handle the following? So for those of you in the military, you know that it is unacceptable to be late. All right? So Monday morning parade at 8.30, okay? You've taken the risk. You've stayed over a little bit late. You've had a bad night's sleep, and you've woken up 20 minutes later than you need to. And you're plowing down the M6, and you come up against this. And you go, oh, my word. All right? Now, generally speaking, what happens is your heart starts racing, okay? You start to feel frustrated. You probably call ahead and let someone know that you're going to be a bit late but they may well turn around and say, well, you should have bloody left earlier, okay? This is an example of a bit of a stress response, okay? This feels, and this is felt by type A personalities in this example. Is there anything you can do about it when you're sat in the traffic? No, okay? And type A personalities have a tendency to want to control a situation, but this is a situation that you can't control, and because you can't control it, it leads to a stress response. That's the feeling of frustration. It might start to swear a little bit. Might be at risk of a road rage incident. Okay? That's an example of where being a type A personality or being in that mindset does not work. Let's look at another one. So, I want you to imagine that you are in this rather nice looking restaurant on the Italian coast. Um, you've come off the beach with your family. You've decided, right, we're going to have lunch. And it's an Italian restaurant, so the service is unbearably slow. Okay? And you're sat there. You're like, come on. I know lots of you would have felt this sensation, all right? And it's ridiculous, <laughs> okay? Because you are on holiday. What is it you're rushing off to do, <laughs> right? You're rushing to get back to the beach to sit down and relax, okay? It makes no sense. And it's just a really simple example of where your natural way of behaving doesn't fit with the context. So I'm a classic type A personality, so this is a bit of therapy for me. I inhale my food, okay, because it's just another thing on the list of things that I want to get done in the day. So I don't sit there and think about what I'm eating. It's just a task, right? Eat, bang, done, okay? I want to move on. So I struggle with this as well. Last one. How do type A personalities handle this? Now, with a lot of corporate organizations, this is a real problem, okay? Because being contactable by email, phone, whatever, allows you to kind of work anywhere. But that can be a problem especially on the weekends, when you've got limited amount of time to play perhaps one of the other roles in your life, okay? So I have a career, I have a business, I'm a husband, I'm a father. I have different roles, different hats I need to wear. The type A personality, when given complete free reign over what they'll spend their time on, will spend their time on work and getting stuff done and going to the gym because they're massively goal-orientated. 
that's how they think and how they see and how they've been taught to believe and understand the world around them. So I find this a challenge, okay? What helps me get back to this or get back to focusing on what I need to spend my time on or focusing on being with my children is simple sort of statements that have really hit me like a rock. As someone once said to me that, um, you know, being a parent is difficult, completely get that. But by the time they are 18 years old, you will have spent 80% of the time you are ever going to spend with your children. It's like, what? You think about that. You think about by the time they hit 18, hopefully they're going off into society, they want to spend time with their friends and so on and so forth. So this time before they're 18 is extremely valuable. Don't waste it just working harder. Okay? It's just designed to shape the way you think a little bit. So I've made it really blunt. I've talked about type A versus type B personalities. The reality is, as we saw, it's a bit of a bell curve. Okay? And what I wanted to do was allude to you or explain to you the fact that you have these mental models. All right? You have natural ways of behaving that have been reinforced through your experience and the environment in which you're in. Okay? Type A personality in the workplace, entirely appropriate, right? Gets lots and lots of stuff done, but it doesn't work everywhere. So what do I invite you to do is think about how am I behaving and is it appropriate to the situation I'm in? Because you don't really want to be in sort of type A personality, you know, process, goal-orientated mode when you're, when you're with someone that's learning something. You know, and I find this every day when I get my daughter up to brush her teeth and she gets dressed for school. I'm like, why does this take her so long? But she's learning it. And I need to change my mindset from being type A into being more type B, being more relaxed, encouraging, nurturing. It's just a change of behavior. These are just two examples of sort of like mental models or collections of models of ways of thinking, all right? The key is that you need to have more than just one. So what I've tried to do is allude to the fact that you sit somewhere on that spectrum. And sometimes that's really good. Or sometimes it's not. So sometimes what, you, what I'm hoping at the end of this is you can think about where do you sit on various spectrums, what models are starting to have an impact on you, and are they appropriate? Are they giving you what you want? Because if you have a very small selection of mental models, it's a bit like having a very small toolbox. And if everything looks like a nail, everything starts to look like a nail if all you've got is a hammer. Um, and what I like to do is sort of think about things that people traditionally hold up as sort of values and go, right, yeah, I agree, I agree, but it's more nuanced than that, okay? So something like in an organization like this, I'm trying to think of, I was trying to think of something that would, that would suit you. Um, but determination, okay, is really key, right? It's a really important uh, element, it's a really important value, okay, in order, uh, in order to survive in an organization like this, all right? You've got to be determined to get the job done. You've got to be determined to get through training, and then you've got to be determined in order to do the job of soldiering. Technology has changed a lot, but it hasn't really changed the fact that people need to be able to carry heavy stuff and shoot at each other. That still hasn't changed a huge amount. So we value determination and we encourage it. But the trouble with determination or the downside of it is that it exposes you to something called the sunk cost fallacy. So this is an example of like, you know, right, you go along to see a movie, this is rubbish. But you're like, yeah, but I'm not leaving because I've spent money on it, okay? When I talk at events in London, I've done them for free and you maybe get 10% of uh, the people turn up. But if you apply the sunk cost fallacy, and you go, I'll just charge them 30 pounds notionally, attendance shoots through the roof, okay? And the reason being is because it's not about coming to hear me speak, it's that they don't want to lose the 30 pounds, and that's what gets them in the room. So that's the sort of downside of determination, that you can be exposed to the sunk cost fallacy. Now, in the cinema, this really doesn't matter. It really, <laughs> a couple of hours of your time, it's irrelevant. In organizations, in governments, in various places, this can take us to a really bad place. So um, there's a brilliant documentary uh, on Robert McNamara called The Fog of War. And in it, he briefly mentions that by 1968, he believed that the war in Vietnam was unwinnable. Okay? I don't think we can get an outcome that we're looking for here. And the Americans pulled out in 75. 57,000 dead 
And the architect of the Vietnam War said at early doors, I don't think we can win this. And so he was shipped out to the World Bank. This is the sunk cost fallacy. I just want you to think about that. We lost around 500 in Afghanistan, and that was a significant campaign. 57,000. That's a hell of a lot of people coming home. And that is all. This is, this, again, that is, it is a simplistic view to say that the sunk, cost, the sunk cost fallacy is entirely responsible. There are lots of things, but that is a large part of it. So once we've started losing people, we will throw good money after bad in order to make sure that we get an outcome. And it's very, very dangerous. Humans are averse to loss. So in Vietnam, maybe we lost, maybe we lost 1,000, and maybe that was, that was a good time to cut our losses and walk away. We're not very good at that. We don't like losing stuff. Okay? And this is everywhere. You just, need to, you just need to have your eyes open to how it's used against you. So I was booking uh, a hotel room in Belgium for March. Off to do some work over there. Um, so this is it, right? Pretty simple booking.com site. Very successful website. And you can see where loss aversion is being used. All right? Two other people looking at this right now. Because what that's saying to me is, you better book this quickly. Because there's two other people looking at this right now. And the hotel only has so many rooms. And that is a fixed rate that's pretty good at the moment. So you can see how it's pushing me to make a decision. Now, if you don't know about loss aversion, this is just complete, you're completely oblivious to these kind of things. But modern organizations understand this stuff, and they use it against you. There's another one here as well. I missed it when I first looked at it. But last booked three hours ago. So in the back of my mind, that tells me something about the rate of bookings. And I'm like, well, this hotel can't be that big. Therefore, I need to get this sorted out. Otherwise, I'm going to go to Belgium, and I'm not going to have a hotel room. These are examples of mental models. I've sort of banged on enough about this for, for a little while now. I'm now going to shift gears slightly and talk about the OODA loop. Okay? Most of you would have seen this slide or some variation on it. The trouble is it's been simplified. Now, it's a four-step process. Okay? It was never meant to be simplified to this level. All right? The trouble with a four-step process is if I give you four things, you immediately say, well, it's kind of 25% each. Right? It's like if I say to you that weight loss is a combination of diet and exercise. That is true, but it's not 50-50. It's very difficult to outrun a bad diet. Trust me. I spent years trying to do it. It doesn't work. Most of it's about what you eat, okay, and the calories you take on board. A fraction of it's exercise, some of it's sleep, all right? This is the simplified version, but it's too simplified. It misses all the nuance. This is the actual OODA loop, okay? Now, don't let that sort of scare you. We're going to go through that bit by bit. The reason I had to talk about mental models to start with is because they sit in the orientate phase, all right? It's analysis and th synthesis. Fundamentally, it's about learning from what works, what doesn't. It's understanding your experience, how that has an impact on the decisions that you make every single day, okay? If you think about a really simple example, if you think about how you have an argument with your partner, right, what do you do when you are criticized? Or what do you do when you get into a, a bit of a row? Pause and think, do any of my parents behave in that way? Because the way in which we handle conflict, as an example, is often learned from a very young age. So if your parents argued and one of your parents went into defensive victim mode, okay, chances are you will have some of those things. All right? That's an example of your experience and to some extent your cultural, tradi uh, cultural traditions. We'll talk about that in a second. With any model, I'm always looking to try and disrupt it and break it as much as possible because I want to test it. All right? This is the only model that I've come across that works on the individual level and the organizational level. So it works for you and it works for a team. It works on a tactical level, so very small scale tactics, four man teams. And it works on the, sorry, very small scale tactics as in you know, troop, troop actions. And it works on a strategic campaign level as I'll prove to you. And lastly, it works in fractions of a second, and it works in years. So it's universal across these things. It's my intent to try and explain how, which is quite difficult. Um, so that's basically what it looks like. We're going to step through it step by step. Where does this come from? 
So uh, this comes from a US Air Force fighter pilot called Colonel John Boyd, who flew F-86s. And uh, after serving in Korea, he went to Top Gun to fight a weapons school. And he basically was a very, very good pilot, arrogant, as many good pilots are. And he basically said to all of the students coming through the school, he's like, we'll go up, and I guarantee you within 40 seconds I'll be able to shoot you down. Now, he was doing this when missile technology was pretty basic. So most of the time, they frankly didn't work. So in order to get a kill, you had to get in behind someone, and you had to engage them with guns. And he was like, I can do that inside 40 seconds. And what he started to come up with was the OODA loop theory. He came up with it through some various, various different ways. But he started to look at winning, fundamentally. He started to look at how do people win? He started to take something that he could do intuitively and break it out into its constituent parts and go, right, how do I teach this? Because if I can teach this to people, they can win. And ultimately, that's what he sort of set out to do. There's a very good autobiography uh, by a guy called Robert Coram on him, which sort of talks about him as an individual. Massively flawed, didn't get everything right, but brilliant, an absolutely brilliant strategic mind. The first phase of it is the observation phase, okay? Revolves around looking at the outside world and getting information on it, okay? And looking at the pattern of changing circumstances to understand what is going on. So when I went through training, the sergeants were very good at explaining to me that, you know, when we used to go out the front gate in Ireland, sometimes things just didn't feel right. And they couldn't really explain what they meant, so they just wrapped it up in a rather brilliant phrase, the presence of the abnormal. It doesn't feel right, okay? And this is an intuitive movement through this process. If you go out and you're like, oh, I'm not sure about this. And I know exactly what it felt like in Afghanistan when we went out. And one minute you'd be looking, at, looking around the town and there'd be women and children. The next minute you'd look up and you'd be like, there's no women and children, all right? Now, to anyone else, to a sort of civilian out there on the ground, they'd be like, what's different? When you're trained to sort of think about that, that's when you can start to cycle through this loop quickly. So you can start to look at it and go, this, is, this doesn't feel right. Let's adopt a more defensive posture. Or let's prepare to be attacked, because that's what's likely to happen. Okay? The observation phase is basically... As I've explained, the world is too complex, okay? So you only ever get sort of snapshots, all right? We like to think that we make decisions based on video feed. The reality is, is they're photos, they're snapshots in time, okay? You look at something, you see it, you make a decision based on that, but it is a snapshot. The video feed goes through the whole loop process, snapshots in time, okay? Now, a lot of organizations I work with, they're obsessed with data because they think it's going to save them and they think it's going to give them access to better decisions. The trouble is with more and more data, more and more information, is it's very, very difficult to see the signal through the noise. Okay, so the, information, the internet has given us more information than we can ever handle. Okay? But the reality is it's just become much, much harder to work out what's valuable and what's not. And I want to sort of bring this to light with a bit of a military example from the First World War. So if you imagine yourself as that soldier in the trench, all right? This is the observe phase, okay? He sticks his head above the parapet to look and see what the Germans are doing, all right? Then he sticks his head back down, and he relays to his troop commander, right, this is what they're doing. As he's doing that, every moment that he's moved from seeing that picture, there's movement in those German trenches, okay? So the picture is changing. It's just a really simple example. If he sticks his head above the parapet and they see him and they start shooting back, they're likely to change what they're doing, okay? They're likely to change their behavior. And that's an example of what kind of what's going on in the world all the time. It's just this constant state of change. Things are moving. By the time you see something behind you, every troop sergeant knows this, right? The moment you print out a troop nominal of all of your guys in your troop, it changes the next day because you get a new joiner. There's no such thing as an up-to-date spreadsheet or a database, okay? Because the world is changing. They're based on imperfect information. We're heavily reliant on our eyesight as well. Human beings have the second strongest eyesight of all animals, other than birds of prey, and we are heavily reliant on it. 
Okay? So we'll look at things very quickly and go, I can't see that. That's a duck. Or is it a rabbit? And you'll make a very quick decision based on it. And it's only when you look at it from a slightly diff different perspective you can go, oh, okay, I can kind of see both there. And a lot of you will be just looking at this image and it's unsettling because it's confusing because it's disrupting the way in which you understand and see the world. And I'm sure most of you are going back and forth from seeing the rabbit and the duck over and over again because it's a confusing image. These are really easy to demonstrate, okay? So this one. I see an old man, right? I see like Shakespeare there. Some people see a woman huddled in a coat walking past a tree. The last one, probably the most famous, is the old woman, young woman one, okay? So the old woman is sort of got the sort of hooked nose and the sort of low jawline and is sort of sunk into her, her top. And the young woman is sort of looking away. Now, all I'm doing is highlighting the fact that you see different things. And the person next to you might see the young woman and the person in front of you might see the old woman. Okay, and this is how we look at the world and we see things differently. The problem is, is that we're energy saving machines, all right? So we will look at something and make a very quick decision and go, that's it, that's it, that's what I see. That is the young woman based on my experience and my way and my eyes. And that is the truth to me and that is the reality. And I see that and that is fact. And someone else can have an equally strong opinion about something else. This is the problem with sort of solving problems. It can be very difficult to understand what is it we're both looking at. So the first thing I think you have to do is be able to accept that other people have different perceptions, other people have different views of the world, and understand that. Your view is not the truth. It's your truth. It's individual to you, but it's not to everyone else. This is also the problem with eyewitness accounts. Okay? We're really reliant on these. And we assume that when people are, when eyewitness accounts differ, we assume someone is lying. In the military, we've kind of worked that out now that we know that we've been through enough shooting events that if everyone says the same thing, they've all got together and decided what the story looks like, okay? People see the world in different ways. So if you've been in a firefight, for example, if you've been in a gunfight and you get caught up in a terrorist attack in London, right, you'll have a better understanding of what it's like to be shot at. So when you say, yeah, the rounds are about six or seven feet past us, Okay, that's probably reasonably well informed based on your experience. To a civilian, it was like they were inches away from us. Completely different experience. Not less valid. They're not lying. It's just their reality to them, okay, based on their perception, their view of the world. Now, all of this stuff, all of these mental models sit in this bit in the middle. That's why I had to go through the mental models bit for you at the start. Because what you need to be able to do is understand them, challenge them when they work, and come up with better ones. And that's what we'll talk about towards the end. This requires me to go a little into a little bit of detail as to why people do what they do. Now, this is a massive, massive subject, and I definitely don't have all the answers. This is something that some of you might have come across before. It's often referred to as sort of the Freudian iceberg. Whether he came up with it or not, I don't know. Um, the key thing with this, right, is this is a, is a very blunt explanation of why people do what they do. So our results are driven by our behavior, okay? That's what you see. But our behavior is driven by our feelings and our thoughts, all of which are underneath the surface. So, for example, in order to be a world-class sports professional, you need to firstly be kind of good enough at the game. You need to be listening to the people around you in order to improve and go through these sort of feedback loops. But also you need to pay attention to your sleep, your diet, your exercise, how you approach things, your mindset. There are a hell of a lot of things. All of that stuff, or a lot of it, certainly the results are all above the surface. It's the stuff that's underneath that's driving it. And that all comes from what we'll collectively just call our experience, all right? And how we think about it. Now, childhood, values, culture, sense of control, we'll, we'll just ca we'll capture it all as sort of the environment in which we grew up in, okay? When I'm talking about growing up in, I, I, that never really sort of ends. So the army, for those of you above the age of 18, that is still an environment in which you are continuing to develop in. Let's look at a couple of examples. And I use one from my, my personal life. 
to sort of talk about it. So if we look at something like relationships and role models. Um, so my father, he's not going to thank me for this, uh, was married four times, which is pretty impressive in terms of just fitting it all in, because that's a lot. Now, that's one, that's just a fact, okay? That happened, that's my background, all right? Um, now, that can have an impact on me. And we'll, we'll, we'll go down two binary routes. That can either, I can either shape that and think about it and go, well, you can't trust women. I don't trust the institution of marriage. I'm not going to commit. Okay? One way of viewing it, all right? Impacts how I think, how I feel, and how I behave. Different partner every weekend. Might be fun. Okay? That's an example of relationships and role models having an impact on, on me if that was the way. I choose to go somewhere else. I choose to go, no, I'm not the same person. I'm not. That doesn't mean that the institution of marriage and partnership is flawed or anything like that. That's just how he chose to behave, all right? But you can see how that's all shaped around my sort of thinking. Okay, that's an example from my environment. You will have examples yourself as well. This is all nurture, and then there's this other part of you, okay, which is all the nature, which we're going to talk about in a second. The key thing is, is that human behavior is shaped by our perception and our mental models, all right? So the mental model I have chosen is that my father is his own man. He's not right or wrong. He has his experience. I choose to learn from that and choose to be different. That's my choice. I'm not following an autopilot, okay? When we were serving off the coast of Somalia, um, we were dealing with pirates sort of inside, you know, up to sort of something like 20 a day on one ridiculous day. And we were sort of basically arresting them, detaining them, bringing them on board the ship. And one of my guys said to me, he said, um, boss, we've got a guy with a broken arm here. So I was like thinking, well, let's get the medic over there, sort it out. And he was like, no, 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 it's, it's been broken a while ago. As this guy, I went over to have a look out of pure curiosity. And this guy basically had a break in his arm, all right? And the bone had never been set properly. So what he had was about a 10 degree angle in it, and one arm slightly longer than the other. Okay. I remember looking at this guy thinking, he has been shot through the wrist or, or had his arm broken. Pretty significant injury. It's never been set. He's probably been dosed up on some antibiotics and sent on his way. And I said to some of my guys, I said to some of them, I was like, you know, we think we're pretty hard being Marines, right? You guys complain when there isn't a second helping of dessert on the ship. <laughs> this guy's been shot through the wrist, and he's basically taped it up and cracked on. All right? Now, I can't understand what it would be like to grow up in Somalia. I can't understand what it would be like to have something like that happen to me. Okay? That's just an example of the environment in which that guy had grown up in. Now, when you think about that, and you start to think about people's environment and how it shapes their behavior, you start to think about the world from their perspective. And so don't get me wrong, I, you know, piracy is a, is a very unpleasant thing. But there was a big way in which my mindset shifted around that. And what I realized was that, do you know what? I'm lucky to be wearing a uniform. Uh, I'm lucky to be on this side. And all of that is a pure accident of the fact that I was born in the West. Because I guarantee you, if I was born on the coast of Somalia, okay, with a guy with the biggest stick and the most weapons rules the roost, I'd probably behave very, very differently, okay? Shaped by my experience, which would be different, all right? That impacts mental models, impacts thoughts, feelings, behavior. I've talked about that enough. Now, what I'm going to do is talk very, very briefly about a psychological concept called the tripartite brain, which a chap called Steve Peters uh, brought to light in his book, the chimp paradox, and he does it far, far better than I do. Um, but he's, what he's talking about, or what he's starting to touch upon, is evolutionary psychology, which is very, very much in its infancy. So really, really simply, um, and I'm going to try and do this in about two minutes, there are three parts of the brain, okay? There's the chimpanzee, there's the human, and then there is the computer, okay? And you can, you can watch this, or you can see the blood moving from these different geographical parts of the brain, okay? You can actually see this happen. Right now, okay, uh, we are all observing the rules of society, okay? So I'm using my human brain, I'm applying logic, 
I'm behaving in a way that you would expect, uh, and as are you, all right? And all the attention, all the focus, and all the cameras and everything are on me, and that's kind of fine, okay? My medic is sat in the audience here, all right? He was my medic when I was uh, in my last job doing the counter piracy stuff, okay? Now, I'm not going to embarrass him. I'm not going to get him to stand up or anything like that, but he knows where he is, obviously. Um, just by saying that, okay, what I've done with him is take the blood from the human part of his brain to the chimp part of his brain, okay? Because he's now thinking, Mike, don't worry, I'm not going to make you stand up. He's now thinking, oh my word, if he makes me stand up or do something, everyone's going to be looking at me. And from an evolutionary perspective, that is awful, all right? Lots and lots of eyes looking at you is a bad thing because this part of your brain that is driven through evolution, this chimp part, basically is like, well, I'm about to get eaten or I'm about to get kicked out of the tribe. So either way, I'm going to die. So it fires a stress response. So it's really interesting because I've done a lot of these sorts of things and I still get that stress response when I'm outside, the dry throat, the bracing heartbeat. That still happens, okay? And that is part of my chimp brain racing okay because I don't want to get it wrong that's basically what happens now the human brain have talked about the computer is the part of the brain that controls the things you basically know how to do okay so none of you think about ironing a shirt none of you think about driving you get in your car you can have a complex conversation on the phone on the way home when you first learned to drive you couldn't do that you were like stop talking to me I've got to work out which one of these pedals I need to press and not stall the car or drive it into the curb okay requires all of your cognitive function, all of your human brain, in order to get it into the computer. Someone cuts you off, and then the chimp wakes up, okay? And it's like, damn you, and you're angry. It's ridiculous, but it's true. And people get killed in road rage all the time for that reason. Because what happens is the way it works is the chimp sits there quietly, but he's watching all the information going in through your head. And he's asking this one question. Again, this is really simplified, but he's asking, am I safe, am I safe, am I safe, am I safe? If the answer is yes, he goes, right, computer and human, you can take over. They can work quite well together. The moment the answer is no, he gets upset, and he fires a fight, flight, or freeze response. And we each have a preference for these, depending on what we've learned and what works well for us. So often in... Uh, so often in sessions where you're dealing with or you're having a conversation with someone who's grown up with parents who've suffered from alcoholism, okay? When they are faced with conflict, their natural inclination is to move towards freezing. The reason being is because when they're faced with conflict or a situation where they feel they might get hurt, okay? That chimp wakes up and goes, right, this is how you have to respond to this. And if you have volatile parents who are suffering from alcoholism, one of the best ways to respond to that is to just remain hidden, okay? And this comes out in the office or in the world all the time. So when you're having a difficult conversation with someone about feedback of their performance, they just totally shut down. And they'll just do anything they can to get away from you. This is why when people are under long-term stress, they often don't come to work. It's just this, it's just running away. It's just the flight response in this instance. And some people get taught to fight back, all right? You see this all the time in road rage. You just spend enough time driving and you'll see people. It's basically two chimp brains smashing up against each other. And people kill each other over it, okay? It's all because of this guy. Now you can learn to manage that, and if you're interested in this sort of stuff, I suggest that you sort of read the book. There are various strategies that you can apply in order for you to be able to perform, okay? The thing is, is that chimp brain fears various things. And the, it's quite... It's not easy, but you can take the environment out of the equation and look at humans and go look at things like, look at things that we're all scared of, all right? Because if we look across cultures and find things that we are all scared of or all wary of, you can start to think, well, maybe it's not the environment that's responsible. Maybe it's a bit like an evolutionary program that's running in the background. I don't understand it. So my daughter, five years old, is terrified of the dark, has to sleep with a nightlight on. Now... From my perspective, this makes no sense. She lives in a house with doors, okay? From her perspective, that logic 
is kind of meaningless. It's absolutely irrelevant. The reason she's scared of the dark is this is like an evolutionary program that is running in her brain. And basically where it comes from is the chimp children that avoided the dark didn't get eaten by the predators. They survived. Three and a half billion years of evolution compounds that over and over again. So we have an inbuilt program running that tells children to be fearful of the dark because you can't use your eyes. You can't see things. So you don't have an advantage. All right? That's an example of evolutionary program. I use this one. Some of you look at that and feel physically uncomfortable. Always when I ask people how many of you are scared of snakes and spiders, you always get a sort of group of like tough guys like, no, no, not scared of snakes or spiders at all. It's like, okay, right. Let's change the question. If I had a bucket of tomatoes here on this stage and I chucked them all over you, you'd probably look at me and go, that was weird. All right, understandably. If I had a bucket of spiders, harmless little spiders here, and chucked them all over the front row, I'd probably get quite a different reaction. All right? And the reason being is because this chimp part of our brain is scared of them. Now, logically, that makes no sense, okay? But humans aren't logical. And this thinking that we are is utterly flawed. It doesn't work, okay? It absolutely doesn't work. In a lot of organizations I work with, they're like, well, the way you get performance out of people is you pay them lots of money, and then they perform. So, like, okay. If that was a rule, all right, the football club with the highest wage bill would consistently win the league. So how did Leicester do it? Why are Liverpool top? Okay. It doesn't explain the rule. Pay someone a quarter of a million pounds a week to do a job, yeah, it's certainly not going to hinder them but it's not going to unlock levels of performance. It's much, much deeper than that. It's flawed thinking, okay? This is also why we're scared of heights. And you can do this test with a uh, young child if you have the, have the equipment. So, um, <laughs> not that I recommend you do it. Um, so basically, if you were to take sort of two, two platforms and put kind of like a glass bridge over it, um, when a baby's quite young and first able to crawl, okay, and its mother's on the other side and some food and something it wants, the baby will crawl across the glass bridge. Okay? It will get from one side to the other because it hasn't learned about this. Right? I was in one of those children's soft play hell holes um, in Swindon <laughs> over Christmas, and I realized that my son had had this evolutionary program switched on when we were walking through one of these sweaty, foam-infested places and there was a perspex screen on the floor and he stopped and all the other kids were running past him and he wouldn't step on it. He didn't understand. He didn't understand the concept of that. He hadn't built a mental model around the fact that he can tread on that. So it was fear that was stopping him from doing it. Now that's his chimp brain dictating the show. It makes complete sense. Because at some point, you want to be scared of heights. It makes real sense. Because again, chimps that didn't, fell out of the tree. That was bad. Now this creates problems in the modern world. Okay? So human evolution is extremely slow. It takes a long, long time. So if I was to turn that, so it's basically really, really quickly. If you take the story of humanity from the origin of life to where we are now, it's a three and a half billion year story. Okay? That's a, that's a long time. The trouble with three and a half billion is that it's very difficult to comprehend that number because we don't work up in that spectrum very often. So, if we turn it into something that we do know, all right, if this was a book, 350,000 pages, that book could be roughly the height of a 40-story building, which is the height of the walkie-talkie in London. Okay? That's a big story. Humans only turn up in the last 20 pages. And if you think about the last hundred years and all the changes that the world has been through, that's the last paragraph of the last page. So we are really not very well designed for the world that we've created, and it causes us real problems. And this is one of the underlying reasons why we've got an obesity problem, okay? Because we know what we're meant to eat, probably something broadly around the sort of paleo diet. You know, you often hear about that, you know, plenty of fresh meat, vegetables, fruit meat, all that kind of stuff, okay? And we know that that's good for us, but we want this stuff, all right? It's not the most appealing meal, but we do. And the reason we want that is because that chimp part of your brain says to you, 
you don't know when you're going to eat again. You better eat as much as possible. So get that on board and put on weight. And the reason it's done that is because it's learned over its three and a half billion years of evolution that when there's food available, you eat as much as possible. Okay? Because you want to put on weight and you want to be able to survive through the periods where there isn't availability of food. So the ones that put on weight survived. The ones that didn't died out. Compound that over three and a half billion years, over that 40 building hype story. And that's why we behave in this way. So going to the gym isn't enough. If you want to lose weight, you've got to understand how you're designed and think beyond that. That's why people are terrified of public speaking. It's the most common fear. It's the reason there's lots and lots of eyes on you. Okay? Again, from an evolutionary perspective, that's pretty terrifying because it means you're about to get eaten. And last way, it's one of the reasons that people don't like to change because change brings uncertainty and uncertainty brings risk and that scares the chimp. That makes him uncomfortable. So people will keep doing what they've always done, especially if it's brought them success. Especially if it's brought them success. Because it's like, well, I've always done it this way. All of this stuff goes on underneath the surface, shapes your mental models. In what proportions? I don't really know. I just know it has an impact. I know it has an impact on me, and I know it has an impact on you. And they're all shaped by our experience. Okay? So Star Wars, right? Rebels. Generally speaking, seen as the good guys. The evil empire, often seen as the bad guys. Let's look at it from a slightly different perspective. Luke Skywalker's a terrorist. <laughs> Just a different way of thinking about it. Okay, Different narrative, different story. That all goes on in here, and I know I've labored on about that. I'll move on now. I have to sort of land that. The next part is the decision bit, okay? We move forward, all right? So you choose a plan. You choose a course of action that was generated in that orientation phase. Some of it's conscious. A lot of it isn't. You choose a plan. You decide on a way forward, okay? You can't select the perfect approach because anything that you do is based on imperfect information. And by the time you've made a decision, the world has already started to change. And in fact, when you start to do something, you have an impact on that environment. So this cycle of complexity is going round and round and round. You don't, you don't need to be able to do it first. You just need to be able, you don't need to be able to do it really, really quickly. It depends. You need to be able to do it faster than your opponents. I'll come on to that in a second. But you have to do something. You've got to start to change the situation. You've got to pick a plan and go with it, all right? Choosing to delay. Deciding to, well, let's just push this back another six months and send it to the committee, okay? That is, that is a decision in itself. Often it's unconscious, though. We think, oh, we'll just kick this down the road and leave it. What you're actually doing is choosing to burn time. So you're choosing actively to burn the most valuable resource we all have. People do this unconsciously all the time in organizations, all the time. Got to have a military example. Okay, to sort of talk about this and, and bring it back. Most of you will have seen Band of Brothers, okay? And the scene in Bastogne where uh, Norman Dyke leads in the attack for Easy Company and effectively gets confused and they get pinned down and he's totally incapacitated, all right? He's freezing, okay? His chimp brain is out of control and he can't do anything, all right? So he tries to pull, but he just comes out with absolute gibberish. And at this moment here, it's like we have to keep moving forward. That's what the sergeant's telling him. All right? And then in walks our heroic leader, okay? Spears. All right? Spears, get in here, take over. All right? He turns up, he asks if you can remember the scene, it's too long to play it. He goes, right, what have we got? It's like we're being pinned down by that sniper. Okay, quick plan. I want you to put mortars on that roof till it's gone. All right? Everyone else follow me. Okay, brilliant. Taking control of a situation, okay? getting people out of the killing zone, having an impact. Now, Spears is often heralded as a kind of combat leader we all want to be. It certainly was for me. I was like, wow, that guy's incredibly brave. He ran through the forward line of troops to link up with the company that was detached, and then he came all the way back. Now, that's bravery in its 
most perfect sense, I guess. That's a really, really strong example of it. But if you watch Band of Brothers 50 times, like I probably have, then you start to sort of understand how Spears thinks. And there's this moment where he talks to one of the privates, and his language reveals how he thinks. His language, what he says, reveals the mental models that he's got. So, I'll go through this very quickly. Lieutenant, when I landed on D-Day, I found myself in the ditch all by myself. I fell asleep, all right? I just kind of stayed put. And Spears looks at him. He says, do you know why you hid in that ditch? He's like, I was scared. He's like, nah, we're all scared. This is the line here. You believe there's still hope. The only hope you have to accept is the fact that you're already dead. Now, if you think about that as a mental model, it's like, I'm not going to live out the war. That's what he's basically saying. I'm going to, I'm expecting to die. You can start to understand how he can behave in that way. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not looking to sort of pass any judgment on that. It's absolutely extreme. It's really, really extreme. Okay? But the extremeness of his views, how he thinks, the language he uses, informs his mental models. That's why he can do that. Because he's like, every minute I live is a bonus, frankly. I'm probably not going to survive this, so I'm going to try and do as much as I can. Okay? That's an example of the mental models having an impact on the behavior. The last bit is the action. Actions feed back into the system. So as soon as you start to do things, you start to feed back into the system. And you're asking yourself these questions. Is this approach working? Yes or no? Have I got the right model? Yes or no? It sounds really, really obvious that people go through their entire lives not understanding this, using the same models that they were taught as children or the same ways of behaving. Okay? So an organization, small organization where a business is failing, okay, often they'll be like, but I'm working really, really hard. I'm working 20 hours a day. It's like, yeah, but you're trying to solve a problem that no one's willing to pay for. You can't build a business off that and you're not looking at the environment, you're not looking at the reaction people are having. I often talk to people and you sort of ask that initial question, so what is it that you do? Some people answer this brilliantly, others, me included, less so. But when it's really, really good, they, they are able to articulate what they do and the value they bring in about 30 seconds, all right? So it's really, really clear. You get about that amount of time to make your sort of first impression. So what do you do for a living? Quite a difficult question to, to answer. Have I got the right model, yes or no? So if the answer is no, you've got to change something. And it's amazing uh, that this is not something that you learn and then you tick the box and that's it. It's something that you keep learning over and over again. So since leaving the Marines, an environment where you know, physical fitness was encouraged, should we say, um, I, I left, what was it, 2012? I had challenges with sort of putting on weight. My sort of weight has gone up and down by about 20 odd kilos, which is ridiculous. Um, and one of the reasons was is I didn't understand, I didn't understand why I was doing what I was doing. So that was one of the reasons I sort of dug into this. But it's the constant check of, is it working? No, change it, do something different. That's the loop, okay? If yes, you gotta learn how to protect the advantage. Now I'm going to change gears slightly and I'm going to bring this to life with some examples. I know I've been talking for just over an hour, okay, so just bear with me. Firstly, as I said before, if you're surprised by something, whether it's a surprise party or someone behaves in a way that you didn't expect, it's an indication that your mental models weren't appropriate. So if you walk into a room expecting to come home, that's your expectation. If there's a surprise party there, it's just a brief ringing of the bell that your mental model was not appropriate for that situation. Okay, now that's kind of obvious, but I want to bring it back to how people use this and how they win. And again, if you look close enough, you see this. So I have to sort of glance down to make sure that I get the figures right. But in 1988-89, Andre Agassi and Boris Becker played each other three times. Okay, Becker won every single one of those games, smashed him off the court, served him into oblivion. Becker had an incredible serve. All right, now. After that, they played each other 11 times. Agassi won 10 out of 11 of those matches. 
and he never really talked about why until I happened to be sat on the sofa watching a clip of the US Open with my mum. And Agassi briefly alluded to this. He said, you know, what I realized after a few games of playing Boris Becker is that when he served, he stuck his tongue out. And if it was straight down the middle, he was serving down the middle. If it was down the left, he was going down the left. And he was like, I built this brilliant reputation as being an expert returner of the serve. The reality is it's really easy to return the ball when you know where it's going. And from time to time, I had to let him ace me. I had to protect the advantage. So for those of you that have seen the Enigma Machine film with Benedict Cumberbatch, it's the same sort of thing. We cannot change everything because otherwise they're going to learn that we've cracked the code. So the way we win the war is a death by a thousand cuts. Agassi was the same. He was like, I've got this advantage. If I let him win every time, if I don't occasionally let him win a service game, he's going to work out that something is wrong. And his coach is going to give him this feedback and say, hey, do you know what you do this? I need to protect this advantage. Now, this is what it's called when you sort of stay inside the OODA loop. When you stay inside and you're one, one step ahead of everyone else. And it's like, how's this guy doing this? You don't, you don't understand that level of control. And the reason is they're just seeing a picture ahead of you. They're just ahead of you. In 2016... England played Italy in the Six Nations with Conor O'Shea at the helm. Now, in advance of that game, Italy were expected to stand no chance. Conor O'Shea knew this. So he's like, I can't play England at their own game. We're just going to get destroyed. So I'm going to do something different. And this was when, if you remember, the Italians didn't compete at the breakdown. So there's no offside line. And you had this brilliant moment where James Haskell was asking the referee... And the referee turned around and said, it's not my job to explain to you the rules of the game. That's a classic example of someone's mental models, their expectations. They go in and they're faced with no offside line and they don't know what to do. Because if you think about every game of rugby they've probably ever played, there's a competition at the breakdown and the Italians weren't playing that game. All right? And it makes you freeze because you're, you're scrabbling around looking for an answer. Okay? Another great example from sport. This one's my favorite. So for those of you that were into chess, um, Bobby Fischer was an absolute chess prodigy and uh, worked his way up to sort of be a, a rated grandmaster and the best American in the world. Um, and he went up against a guy called Spassky in the 1978 World Championships. And Bobby Fischer played the longest game of deception possibly ever. Because what he did was he's like, I know that in the, you know, in the, Fisher wanted to win, all right? He was all about winning and playing the long game. So when he sat down to play a game of chess, he always started with pawn to king four, some, some basic movement like that. Really, really simplistic, okay? And the reason he did that was twofold. Firstly, um, he said, imagine how a football team would play if they started every game 1-0 down. They'd have to go for it. They'd have to attack. It'd be the same with the rugby team. So if I start myself from a position of deliberate disadvantage, I'm forced to play more aggressively and go for the win. So it's like training in every single game that you play. Second thing is, is that he knew that this world championship would become a bit of a synonym for the Cold War in the same way that Rocky IV is. Uh, and he said, that, he said that the Russians will be studying my game. So Spassky will have a whole load of support behind him of chess grandmasters and, excellent, and experts. And they will be building models of how I play the game based around what I've done historically. So everything revolves around this movement, this very simple starting block. Sits down to the World Championship, 1978 completely different move. Now, imagine you're Spassky. Everything that you've done, all of your preparation, just goes straight out the window. It's like sitting down to an English A-level exam and being given a physics paper. You can imagine how you panic in that situation. And you see, when you panic, you make bad decisions, okay? You're frantic, you're all over the place. And he won. And he played that game, he played that con for 16 years 
he started himself from a position of disadvantage. We've seen it before in terms of deception as well in the Gulf War. The first one, not the second. Okay? So John Boyd, the architect, the architect of the OODA loop, helped come up with this plan. And he said, basically, if you think about it from the enemy's perspective, right? The jewel in the crown is Kuwait. So let's convince them that that's where we're going. So they did a lot of amphibious maneuvers off the coast of Kuwait. So the Iraqis are like, right, that's where they're going. They're going into Kuwait. That's where they're most likely to attack. So they move all their pieces around the chessboard, all their divisions south. And it's a big deception piece. We move all the way through we do that flanking maneuver through the desert, okay? Takes a huge number of pieces off the chessboard without a single person being hurt, injured, killed, which is ultimately what you want to do. Maneuver warfare is about breaking the opponent's will to fight. If you cause them to panic because you break their mental models and you set them up for failure, you, you set them up for failure, you will win. Some of you would have watched the brilliant documentary, We Were Kings. Again, find, our, find examples of this everywhere, all right? George Foreman, okay? Brilliantly powerful boxer, bludgeoned all his opponents into submission. If you've been successful doing that approach, why bother changing it, okay? Now, some people say that Muhammad Ali was fearful of that. I'm not sure he was. My view is that, it's like, I know George hits the heavy bag really hard, okay? I know that. Why do I need to see that over and over again? So what Ali did was basically soak up the punches, okay? In the hot heat of Africa, he basically sucked it up and just took a lot of punishment, all right? And in about the eighth round, he pulls George Foreman in close, and he just says to him, is that all you've got? And George's one mental model, his one way of fighting a boxing match, no longer works because he's not having an effect. But because he's built his success on that model, he can't change when he's under pressure. He can't adapt to the circumstances. All right? And then Muhammad Ali is able to go after him because he's exhausted. Last example from a sort of tactical perspective. Everyone remembers the incident of the terrorist on the train. Okay? It's pure luck that there were some servicemen there. All right? But as they walked past the toilets, they heard the sound of a cocking rifle. Now, a lot of you in this room will recognize that. You know it's a very, very distinctive sound. And as the guy came out, they basically grabbed him. Now, if you think about a terrorist's mental model for what is likely to happen, okay? If a terrorist came into this room right now and started spraying everything, okay? Most people are going to be running to the exits. I'm certain to be going behind that curtain. Most people are going to be running to the exits and trying to get out of there, okay? The terrorist understands that. So he's like, what am I going to do? I'm either going to trap the exits, I'm either going to lock them, or I'm going to start aiming at the exits. So he's playing out a way of predicting the future based on his model of the world and what is likely to happen, all right? And when he comes out of the toilet and he lifts his rifle and someone grabs it, he's not expecting that. This is slightly controversial, but this is why I believe that the American advice of run run, hide, fight if you can, is better than our advice of run and hide. Because if you run and hide from a terrorist, what are they likely to do? They're likely to come in and find you. If you look at the horrific events that happened on London Bridge, it was when people fought back, create the will for other people to start acting, do something, get in their face. Very, very brave thing to do, obviously. But that's what that's what had an impact in that situation there. Blockbuster and Netflix were a good strategic example. Okay? So Blockbuster were kings of the high street, all right? unable to evolve their business model. Netflix, their observe, orientate, would have gone something like this. Okay, so let's make some assumptions about the future that we can safely say. Internet speed is likely to get faster, and more and more people are going to watch content online. So maybe we should reposition and change our business model so that we are online focused. Both of them started, excuse me, as DVD rental companies. Blockbuster couldn't change. They couldn't adapt. They couldn't reorientate themselves to a new world. Netflix could. This is why we don't see Blockbuster anymore. In Afghanistan in 2007, where I served, 
and where I appreciate many of you have, the OODA, OODA loop was used to great effect against us. So I passed out of training in December 2006. A lot of my friends went out on Herrick 5. I deployed on Herrick 7. And when speaking to the guys that came back, I was like, what was it like? And they said, be prepared to carry eight to 10 magazines because you're going to go through them. You're going to get into a lot of firefights. And that's what it is. I remember asking about the ID threat. And they said, there isn't really much of an ID threat. It's not like Iraq. I'm thinking, OK. And people came back from Herrick 5, and they were certainly quite corpus. They loved it. They'd had a brilliant time. They'd enjoyed it. They'd been tested in an environment in which they knew how to handle a firefight. Right? All of the training based around here will also include something very similar. You know what to do when someone starts shooting at you, and it becomes instinct. IEDs started to appear on my tour in 2007, and they were pretty basic. All right? We think about what the Taliban would have been doing. They were losing the shooting war. They were being shot at. We were following up with air and all the close air support that we've got, and we were hammering them. So they would have gone, well, look, we're losing, so we need to change the way we play the game. And in their view, our use of air power and Apache helicopters was dirty tactics. So they're like, if we're going to fight dirty, we'll fight dirty. This is when they started to evolve and start using IEDs. Now, come Herrick 14, you know, totally in different environment, right? Completely different environment. You're going out the gate with a metal detector in single file. That's not patrolling, right? This is an example of way they have orientated differently, rethought about how they fought a war and used it against us. Do something, test the hypothesis, see how it has an impact on the environment, get new data. Last couple of things before I move on to the sort of bit about uh, how we implement this. So tempo is not speed, right? If I walk across this stage at a pace that's very slow, I can speed up, but I'm still predictable, right? If you were trying to shoot me now and I'm starting to run, you'd probably hit me. Tempo is if I move all over the place, okay? Tempo is unpredictable. This is what they talk about in Top Gun, when he says, you hit the brakes, he'll fly right by. That's tempo. Rapid increases in acceleration and deceleration in this world, all right? That offsets people. If you just keep going faster, you become predictable. You need to be unpredictable. Do people really learn from their mistakes? <laughs> Hopefully, but not always. People go through their entire lives playing out the same mental models that they've been taught, doing the same things they've always done. You'll see this in your friendship groups, right? The people that are late to meetings are always late to meetings. And that behavior doesn't change. They just keep doing it. They're kind of fine with the sort of social embarrassment, I guess. I don't know. But the people often go through their entire lives making the same mistakes over and over again. So what? What do you do about this? This won't take me too long. You've got to build a toolbox of mental models. Most successful investor of all time, Warren Buffett, talks about this. He actively talks about this. So he's giving this stuff away. He's like, what you want to do is you want to build a lattice work of mental models that, so you have a better understanding of how the world works. I make better investment decisions because I'm clear on what I know and what I don't know. And I play where I can win. And he talks about that. He talks about learning how to learn, unlearning, very difficult thing to do. In terms of your observation, you've got to consider your information diet. Okay? So you've got to consider what do you spend your time doing? What do you spend your time reading? What impact does it have on you? Because if you read the Daily Mail, i use that as an example, you are likely to move towards the right, politically speaking. Okay? You read The Economist, generally speaking, better information, all right? Better information, better decisions, better understanding of the world. US have got a real problem with this in their politics at the moment because it's too easy to think the other side are just bad. They're not. They just see the world differently to you. So two examples of something that are quite uh, provocative in American politics at the moment. Second Amendment, gun legislation, and anti-abortion. The Republicans believe that the right to the Second Amendment, the right to bear arms, is their constitutional right. So to them, that is all about freedom. 
freedom. And that abortion is about death. And if you look at some of the stuff that they on, online related to abortion, it's pretty unpleasant. Okay? That's their view. Guns are about freedom. Abortion is death. Democrats see it totally the other way. Guns are about death and abortion is about freedom. That's how they view the world. Two different perspectives. Okay? The other side aren't necessarily wrong, they just see it differently to you. If they start to become the enemy, that starts to become a problem. Expand your circle of competence. This is why it's really worrying when Donald Trump says he hasn't read a book in his life. Because there's a paradox with knowledge. So knowledge is a little bit like um, a clearing in the forest. So if you're stood in a clearing and you've read, say, 10 books, okay, that's like 10 trees around you knocked down. It's a very small clearing, right? But it gives you a very strong understanding or a very strong belief that you understand the world because everything fits into these relatively small mental models. The paradox of knowledge and of people that have wisdom, to use a very old-fashioned term, is that the more you realize, or the more you learn about the world, the more you realize you don't know. So as you start cutting down these trees and learning more and more, you just go, oh my word, I thought I knew stuff. I really don't know anything. Okay? And people spend their time in pursuit of the wrong things. Um, I'll come on to talk about that in a second. Who would you rather have in your team? This goes to all ranks, all right? This is soldiers, officers, generals. Two people, both have a good understanding of British military doctrine because they've been through Sandhurst and they've read the stuff they're supposed to read. Or would you rather have someone that's got an understanding of psychology, an understanding of philosophy, of how to live well, an understanding of history, the Vietnam failure, the Russian experience in Afghanistan? If you understand that, imagine how that can have an impact on how you think and how you behave when you deploy evolutionary biology. These are just some of the things that I've looked at, economics. The key is, is that you've got to stay broad. This is what Boyd said. He says you need to understand biology, mathematics, physics, economics, history, philosophy. You need to read widely because they give you access to a variety of mental models. And I invite you guys to consider which one are you. The one on the left? My left, or the one on the right, okay? Comes down to a really simple question. If you had a serious life decision, real challenge, real big question, okay? Do you want to have a conversation with a guy that's read 5,000 books, or the person that's watched 5,000 hours of reality TV? Why? And how do you spend your time? It's just worth reflecting on. These are a couple of things, or these are some of the areas that I've sort of looked at and I really, really think are, are brilliant. I've, I've highlighted this one because I found it relatively recently. But if you're interested in mental models and decision making, the Farnham Street blog is the best. Okay? It is the best one out there. These are ways in which you can take information on. If you don't like reading, it doesn't matter. Listen to podcasts. I find it quite difficult to read or listen to an audio book. That doesn't matter. Change the way in which you do it. So listen to a conversation on a podcast. Choose things that work for you. Navigate. Be broad. Listen to TED Talks. Learn things. Try them out in your world. See how something that you've learned on one of these podcasts, I don't know, with Jocko Willink, apply something that you've learned from him to one of your soldiers or someone in your environment. Try it, reflect on it. What worked, what didn't work. Go again. That's what continuous improvement looks like. And this is the thing, right? You're playing a different game now. So what most people are looking for is articles that basically look like that. Ten ways to get smarter and be productive and do everything with zero effort. That's what people want, and it's rubbish. All right? Can't happen. It's just it's, the world doesn't work like that. Everyone wants the executive summary. They want, they want, I, want, I want to know everything you're going to talk about over the next hour, but I want it in 168 characters. Go. It's like, right, okay. I can't do that. It's impossible. You can't fast track this stuff. So you have to play a different game. Now, compound interest is one of the most powerful forces. It applies to money, obviously, mostly, but it also applies to knowledge. 
Now, Elon Musk and Ben Franklin have figured this out, okay? Both very, very successful individuals with a very rigorous attitude to learning. And Ben Franklin had a five-hour rule. He said, if you spend an hour a day improving yourself, that has a compound interest effect. You keep orientating, adding to your toolbox and mental models. Everyone else is playing that game. You're playing this game. And with all of the people that I've looked at and all of the people that are really successful in quite a traditional sense, I've sort of looked to deconstruct, they spend a lot of their time learning. So Stanley McChrystal, who I believe is going to come and speak at some point, gets up, he works out, he's listening to audiobooks. He's changing the way he thinks. It's not getting to four-star general by accident. He's doing something different. Everyone loves a picture of Charles Darwin, but this kind of does make the point nicely, okay? Our world is built around adapting to change. Organizations that, or organisms, sorry, that are able to do that, individuals that are able to do that, and organizations that are able to do that stand a chance of success. Thank you.